Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for the privilege of gathering in the name of your Son. And thank you for the promise that he makes, that when we gather together in his name, he is here. And so, Lord, with both hunger and gratitude, we say to you, O oh Lord, we thank you that you are here. Open up our hearts and our minds to your presence. Pour out your grace, your mercy, and your spirit as we gather together in your name. And so we do say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. It is a joy to be with you and an honor because, quite honestly, I like being in places where God is doing something. Where I walk in and I'm greeted by people who are clearly sisters and brothers in Christ. And we can talk together about what's happening here and share stories and listen to what the Lord is doing. That there is a kind of flow that happens between places that causes at least people like me to feel very quickly at home. Even this morning when we got there, after having really a lovely dinner, a bunch of us gathering together at a little restaurant called The Avenue, and chatting and praying together, in fact. I walked in this morning, and we got here early. There was a rehearsal to start, but we came before the rehearsal. And what I always do, actually, is that I walk into the church, and I walk around, and I pray, and I, I try to get a sense of the place. And I want you to know that as I walked this place, up and down these aisles, I sensed a great well of the presence of the Spirit of God. Still, quiet, but deeply and profoundly present. And that gave me a great personal joy, because I know that BJ, BJ's been in the well. He knows what it is to be in the presence of God. And it is because of that, I'm more than happy to stand here and invite him into that place where he is not just in the presence of God, but actually is a channel of the presence of God. Because you see, that's actually the essence of the meaning of ordination. It's not just that the Holy Spirit is within you as a believer, you say, Jesus is Lord, you're a baptized Christian, you've received the Holy Spirit. But to stand in a position of ordination that its heart says, not only do I believe that Jesus is within me by his Holy Spirit, but I've been called for him to flow through me, to be, in, in essence, an expression of the presence of God. And so in the midst of what really is a kind of wonderful God-ordained alchemy, God takes personality, background, upbringing, church preferences, doctrine, including quirky doctrine, because all of us have some quirky doctrine. We, we won't actually all get it right until we see him face to face. Between now and then, all theological arguments are qualifiers, because we just, as Paul says, we know in part, we don't have it all, you see. And in the midst of all of that, God molds all of that together in a way that uniquely expresses some aspect of the life and presence of Jesus through one individual, who in that light becomes a gift to the rest of the body because, B.J., there's something that God is expressing through you that is important, unique, and profound in and through you that is not the same as Edward, your rector, me as your bishop, or even Kim, your wife, you have a role to play that the Lord has ordained for you, that it comes out of the deepest part of who you are. As Jesus says, it is out of your innermost being that flows a river of living water. And it is in fact to that that you are saying yes, for the flow of God, not just to inhabit, but for you to be on the ready. For him to flow through you anytime, any place, with anyone that he chooses. As one of the lines that Paul says is that we may no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died for us and rose again. 
And a part of the essence of ordination is to say, I'm willing to live that kind of available life. So that whether I'm up at the altar, whether I'm in a Sunday school class, or whether I'm paying for my gas at the local convenience store, or I'm chatting with a waiter in a restaurant, wherever I find myself, I'm there as someone who God has ordained to be present in such a way is that perhaps, by God's mercy, a spiritual conversation begins to happen. But sometimes the most unlikely of people but you are willing to be a part of that flow, that, that great life, which I have to tell you, I wouldn't trade for anything. Is there a price? Oh yeah. <laughs> There's a big price. And in some ways, the, the lessons for today both describe both the price and the opportunity. It, uh, the invitation really comes in the collect. Let the whole world see and know the things which were cast down are being raised up, which that which has grown old is being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by Him. That's the statement, the sort of universal statement. What is God doing? That's what God is doing. He is raising up that which is cast down. He is making new that which had grown old. And that all of us, by the mercies of God, not by our own qualifications, are being made new. God is at work and doing something. And therefore, we are invited to be a part of that. But the price is this. The price is all of us are very at home at one level, living in the old. In essence, the former. That's how we ground ourselves. That's, I don't know about you, but that's how we're raised. I mean, I was taught very carefully about what my family did or did not do, and who we were. It was a great expectation. I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, and, there, and all of my siblings still live there. My mother, who is 95, still lives there, and my father considered it an act of betrayal when I moved from Richmond, Virginia, <laughs> to, to be a curate at All Saints in Winter Park, Florida. Because you see, Richmond don't move away. <laughs> All of us are given some of that kind of mix, right? It doesn't necessarily reflect the gospel at all. But it is, in fact, the traditions of family and community, some of which we deeply treasure, and some of which we immediately recognize is a part of the old that really ought to go away. But what most of us do not know is how deeply ingrained and informed by those very traditions that don't look like the gospel of Jesus at all. And so what happens to us, because we have said yes, because we want to be a part of what God is doing, is that we are in essence saying yes to, to quote the Isaiah lesson, to say yes to being undone. And not just once, but literally again and again and again, we are brought face to face with something that was very much a part of what we believed to be true, even taught to us by our Sunday school teachers, God being my heart. But in the face of Jesus Christ, we recognize that it is in fact an old wineskin that needs to go away. And some of which we've enjoyed. And therefore there is that process of God peeling it away because those are things that help shape our identity. And that's where the being undone, the being upended is, is that because we're challenged in a way to see ourselves differently from the way we thought we were supposed to be, that we might more and more be, <laughs> not like, you know, 2019, in your case, Anglo man, but more like the image of a Jewish carpenter who spoke out of a deep, or deep, different well of wisdom than most of the people that we know, including the people that we have revered. It, it's a new voice. But Jesus promises, my sheep hear my voice and know by name. And so the thing that at least I pray in the midst of the cacophony of voices that want to shape you and that want to inform you, I mean, this morning, 
I was downstairs at the Embassy Suites getting breakfast. There were four different televisions on. Don't you think they want to shape you? Don't you think they want to tell you what is in fact important? And by choosing not to talk about something, it is therefore socially not important? I mean, it, we live in a culture where being informed, up to date, being sensitive to the, to, the, to the times, the tune of our culture, is in fact a part of a job description. We're expected to know those things. The challenge is, how can you know those things but not also be shaped by them? If the call is to be a light in the midst of darkness, to allow the flow of the Holy Spirit to move through you, that honestly, in my opinion, probably doesn't care much about much of what we see on TV. But that is, in fact, a challenge. So there's a continual process <laughs> of being upended. Woe is me, I am undone. I mean, I want you to know the more you say yes to Jesus, the more you will be upended. The more you will look less like even the better Episcopalians that you know. The more you will care less about things that are deeply important to some people. But honestly, in the light of the gospel matter a little, including some of your clergy friends. It is by its very nature God's act of taking me and saying, no, 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 you belong to me. And drawing you aside from sometimes even the most sweet of fellowships so that you might be alone with him and be shaped by him. Because it is only by that shaping, that drawing away, that you're actually brought into the place of rest that's described in the Philippian letter. There is, in fact, a direct correlation, in my opinion, between the deep rest of which Paul speaks and the kind of time that he spent literally by himself in the presence of God, where you learn, in essence, to say no to the rest of the voices, where you learn to allow your heart to be still enough to imbibe of that well, because most people seeing that well would just think of it as just another calm lake and keep looking at their phone to see what's next on Twitter. And therefore, to make the time to shut those things down and to be still in the presence of God actually becomes the resource that you need to be able to live in the world as someone who God is using to be his, a part of his plan for the Lord of the harvest to do his work through you. You see, there's a relationship here. A willingness on the one hand to be undone, and God's going to do it if you ask him, I promise. Out of that, to be drawn away into places that sometimes feel lonely, but actually the places where you can more deeply meet God. And out of that, receive a place of peace and rest that allows you, in the midst of the cacophony of voices, in the midst of the demands of the public square, in the midst of all of the things that you are your responsibility as a public figure for the sake of Jesus Christ. You're not called to the monastery. At least that's what Kim tells me. <laughs> so in the midst of that, to be able to be in that place, hearing the voice of the shepherd, being available for him to use you, guarding the place of quiet, but not as a place of isolation, but instead as fuel for the ministry that God has given you in that kind of public role. Because it is only in that place of rest that you actually have the eyes to see those who are like sheep without a shepherd. It is only in that place that the heart of compassion is worked in you in such a way that you flow out. It's like the Holy Spirit just moves through you. Are they like you? Not necessarily. That's, but you see, that's no longer important. You're not trying to build social capital to get the work done. You're available for God to use you to the people that he sends you away. And it doesn't matter what they give back to you or not. That's not why you're there. You're learning how to let go of the need to be well thought of, liked. Oh, man on the move. He'll be a leader one day. Someday, BJ, he'll be a bishop. I just know it. Ignore that, please. <laughs> But instead, see what God would have you do. What's the next step? Who has he put in front of you? 
How do you become, by the mercy of God, a shepherd to your children? How do you, by the mercy of God, love your wife? How do you, by the mercy of God, take care of this flock who loves you dearly? Otherwise, they wouldn't be here today. And to lead them in a way that actually takes them with you into those public places where the name of Jesus has to be spoken. Because he loves them just as much as anybody sitting here in the pew. The Lord of the harvest being raised up and raising you up in the process to do his work. That's what it means, at least in my opinion, to be ordained, to be that vessel for the Spirit to flow through you in a way that not only leads others, but changes you in the process. And again, not just once, but again and again and again. Precisely because we do know in part there's always more to be revealed. Our heart needs to be changed to receive more of what God wants to show us because we're still caught up in a lot of the presumptions that really look more like the world, the culture, than what is what God wants to do both in us and through us. He, God doesn't let up. I've been ordained for now 40 years. And I have to tell you, I'm just as eager I'm just as much being changed. I am just as much fueled by the power of the Spirit than I was when I was sort of deep in at 25. I wouldn't trade it for anything. But the requirement is that you keep saying yes, no matter how high the price. So BJ, would you please stand? I wish that I could promise you a quiet life. I cannot. I wish that I could promise you a life where you are not upended and where there is a level of predictability to who you are becoming that you could count on for the future. There are, a lot of, there are a lot of people who actually need that kind of future assurance. I hope you're not one of them because you won't get it. <laughs> what you will get, however, is the promise of glory that comes to all who call upon his name. But between here and glory, it, there are twists and turns that you cannot predict. At each point in your life, you will be faced with a juncture where you will be asked to pay a new price, perhaps that you didn't anticipate. But to say, yes, to Jesus will be asked of you. May God give you the capacity to keep saying yes, so that not only are you shaped and changed, but that others might more and more see Jesus in you and have the courage to say yes as well, and keep saying yes. Yes. Amen. Amen.